Okay, so let's resume. Let's look at environment sensors and uh, also the sound nodes, uh, how we do it. And um, uh, usual structure, but a lot to talk about. First we talk about uh, common fields and then we'll first start looking at our environment sensor nodes, load sensor, proximity sensor, and visibility sensor. And these are distinct from environmental effects where we had uh, background and fog we saw in a previous chapter. But these are environmental sensors, okay? The load, proximity, and visibility sensors are keeping track of what's going on in the environment. First, uh, load sensor looking for other nodes getting properly loaded so that uh, they're initialized and the scene can begin animation. Proximity sensor and visibility sensor tell whether or not the user is close enough to an object or looking at an object so that you can use that as a cue to begin animation. Okay, so uh, concepts. Well, this is an easy one. Uh, starting out with enabled. We've seen this guy plenty of times before. Enabled tells us whether or not we've turned our sensor on or off. And if you look in X3D's uh, typing, node typing, you'll see that enabled indeed is part of all of our sensor nodes so that we have a common uh, functionality that's consistent between all of them. Okay, so uh, since you often have a big involved animation chain of one thing, sensor acting as a trigger, and then a clock, and then an interpolator, or a sequencer, and then a target node, that whole 10 step process, uh, often the simplest way to disable that is simply turn the trigger off. Turn the sensor off by setting enabled equal to false. And that way you don't have to mess around with this carefully constructed chain of events, but instead uh, you can control it at the source, whether you want it to be uh, uh, disabled or active and doing what it's supposed to do. Okay. And as we've seen uh, uh, separately, we're starting to add more and more validation to X3D uh, namely uh, Schematron validation is something we're working on right now and this will help us uh, get cued as authors when we forget a route or when some step that we think we might have taken isn't quite there yet. So it is important to pay attention to that. If uh, there's no route then there's no way for the event to flow. Okay, pretty basic all review there. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, is active is another field we've seen before uh, in some sensors and it tells whether or not the sensor uh, is doing its job whether it's gotten a user input or an environmental input and uh, it sends two possible values for that so uh, it sends a true if things are going on, it sends a false when it stops being successful, if we're no longer proximate to it, and then you're done. These only get sent uh, once. For each interaction. And that's important so that we're not spewing out true events or false events all the time. There's no need for a continuous output here. Say it once and be done with it. Okay? And I guess we could modify this thing. Uh, we should probably say environmental. Might be a better way to say it, but then again, For proximity sensor, for visibility sensor, that is based on user interaction, so uh, they do depend on user there. Load sensor does not. 
say. Uh, those is active values then are good uh, as booleans to turn on or turn off other things. They can be your triggers to uh, begin other animation. All right, and you do have to be careful as we were with touch sensor that you don't want rapid toggling of true, false, true, false, true, false. That's easy to provoke. Uh, you know, if you have something just on the edge of your field of view and you're going a little bit back and forth, that might be triggering those two true-false values. So uh, you might want to insert some additional logic in between those, such as a toggle mode that remembers it once and just holds it there, or it starts a time delay before anything else is allowed to change, so that you uh, uh, have, say, a hysteresis to have a stability in this thing and not not uh, bistable twitching back and forth of what's going on. Okay, some more uh, common fields adapted again here uh, for the environmental sensors are center and size. And so uh, very reminiscent of bounding box uh, center and size. Okay, and so the volume of the node is specific to the visibility of the node or the uh, proximity sensor. Proximity sensor, whether you tell you're close enough, it's not a range-based computation as in a straight line range, but rather it's are we within a volume defined by a box? That's when we're proximate enough or not. Okay, so that center and that size, of course, as with any other, translation type of value are dependent on their parent transforms. Okay, so you can move these boxes around and put them where they belong so that you don't always have to have everything in the center of the universe, um, but, but can make it for anywhere. Sometimes we do use, as we'll see, proximity sensor where we keep it at zero, 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 and then uh, just make the box very, very large, like a, say a million meters on the side, and that way we can use that as a way at runtime to get what are my current coordinates of the viewer? What is my current orientation of the viewer? You can use that to get the absolute terms of where they are at any given moment. Okay. Now, this is, uh, the warning might be a little bit out of order here, but uh, uh, since these fields are common, it's, it's where we bring it up. If, if what we have is an active volume, of, of things going on, and you're either in the box or out of the box uh, for these true, true and false events to get sent, then uh, it would be interesting if they overlap. Okay, and you can hopefully see here from this picture that uh, it's quite possible to have two boxes that coincide, that intersect, that have a common space. Well, it gets very hard to say then, are we in or are we out, and in which one? And, and uh, it's not that you can't do it, you can, but computationally, <coughs> Under the hood, it's quite possible to create some very pathological situations that are <coughs> extremely expensive to determine just what's going on. And uh, because we're always trying to optimize for rapid, real-time, interactive response, we don't like putting things in the spec that might slow things down. So uh, a response to this then is basically a warning to say, don't overlap them. You should avoid that. And uh, because we like to uh, not specify how not to do things, we'll simply say in the spec, 
we've seen this before, that if you violate this warning, if you violate this good practice, then results are undefined. Meaning one tool may fail one way, another tool may fail another way, a third tool may not fail at all. They may have figured out how to do it satisfactorily. What we don't do is legislate the precise failure mode you're supposed to have because this usually means that algorithmically it's difficult, it's time consuming and expensive to uh, cope with the case. So if that's true then it would also be time consuming and expensive to simply detect the case. So if we were going to say the browser must tell you when this consideration has occurred and tell you what's wrong, well that's the same as saying, computationally it's the same as saying, the browser must solve that condition. Okay, so instead we say, don't do that. Doctor, doctor, my arm hurts when I go like this. Okay, don't put your arm up like that. Avoid it. Okay, what else can we say? We can say that in these uh, two fields, if we set the size of the box equal zero, 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 then you can never get in there. So that's the same as setting enabled equals false inside one of these uh, boxes. Okay, what other common fields do we have? Well, enter time and exit time are uh, SF time variables, meaning they'll give you a timestamp of when the condition is met for that sensor either a visibility condition or a proximity condition. And as we've seen before, uh, is active might be good, but it's sending a Boolean. So if the node we're looking at is expecting a time value as its trigger, then to hook up the Boolean to the time value, we'd have to put in a uh, Boolean trigger, and it's just another node, and another pair of routes, and uh, more work. So um, further, sometimes if you're using a script, or something else computational, you might want the time value. You might want to see, well, what was the duration? How much time elapsed since the last time I, I came here? How frequently are people visiting my room? Okay, so you might well want those time values uh, to see that it's there. Okay. Okay. Uh, the good news on is active versus enter time and exit time is that uh, functionally they're uh, always paired. You'll, you'll get, when, you get, when you're getting one, you'll get the other. So it's your choice basically which type of event, either a Boolean or an SF time value, number of seconds since January 1st, 1970, is appropriate for the routing chain that you're constructing. Okay, so here is one of those uh, routing chains of uh, interest where the user is clicking a button and uh, starts a timer clock and uh, we've seen this event animation chain many times. This is the ba basis so far of uh, 12-step uh, program. So we see it here again. Uh, is a review just to say where does this fit then? Where do these nodes fit? Basically they fit as trigger nodes. Okay, so let's uh, now look at the first one and load sensor. How does that work? Well, load sensor is looking for external resources to see if they've been successfully loaded at runtime. So these might be things like an inline node that's pulling in other geometry it might be uh, image texture where you're waiting for that uh, 2D picture to come in and get draped over the geometry. Perhaps that's a sign telling the user, go over here. Um, it might be an audio clip uh, so that there's uh, uh, audio feedback. Uh, could be a movie. These types of things. Now, uh, this, historically this was a source of great frustration in X3D and, and especially in Vermal because we did not have a load sensor. And so uh, we'd written a network language but there wasn't any feedback loop about whether the network was delivering. So you would find yourself setting up these elaborate animation chains without any way of knowing are all the pieces in place for them to properly execute. 
So load sensor is our way of sensing the network, sensing whether some resource has been loaded so that we can uh, keep track of it. Okay, so this is how we, we can now pause the action. You would say, if you had an important, compelling, informative animation that tells the user something they need to know, you don't want to start that until all the researchers are in hand. So they don't see an invisible sign, they don't see so I have a fancy geometry moving around that hasn't been loaded yet. Uh, so this is why uh, uh, authors can take advantage of load sensor to pause, to preempt, to postpone the uh, uh, commencement of animation until we're all ready. Okay, uh, some points of minor interest or at least unusual. One is uh, you can't put an anchor as a load sensor node because uh, if we think about it, when anchor geometry gets selected by the pointer and a URL is invoked, we're really not loading things into the current scene. We're either launching another scene, anchor linked to other X3D, in which case, hey, it's in charge and the scene we were in just got uh, replaced. Or our inline has a bookmark link, a pound sign and the def name to go to the viewpoint of interest in the scene. So viewpoint transitions are predictable and they're already there. Uh, you can't bind to a viewpoint that was in another scene, so if, if your viewpoint's there, then um, we can link to it. So that's why Anchor is not one of the load sensor nodes. Something else to pay attention to is uh, container field. And we've been very lucky so far, at least I think we've been lucky, we've uh, been able to avoid the use of container field uh, in most cases. Container field is the name of node, which is a field. So it's the field name of a contained node. Now the idea here has been that every field has a name so that you can send values to it. And some of them are very simple, like enabled is a boolean. So we can, that field can have a true or a false value. Uh, if it's a color, then it might have a, it would have simply an RGB variable. Uh, if it's a children array, if it's uh, some contained node, then it also has a name to it. But in this case, instead of getting simple typed values, it would be getting node type values. Well, the parent-child relationships, since you can have multiple parent-children uh, in, in many of the nodes, this is why we, ha we, we do have names for each one of those. And the field name of those contained nodes, we've given the term container field in X3D as a way to capture it. And the reason we haven't had to pay attention to it uh, practically at all up till now is because it's very predictable. It's almost always the same. Um, if a viewpoint uh, appears as a child of another node, it's going to be part of the children field. Uh, if uh, an image texture appears as part of a appearance node, it's going to be in the texture field. Same thing for movie texture, okay? So uh, those defaults are always the same, but for load sensor, it's usually pointing to something else. It doesn't have children, it doesn't have texture. Uh, those are all dissimilar. So rather than saying it doesn't have a name, we do give it a name. It has the name of watch list, and um, that means whenever we give a load sensor a child that uh, we want to put it in there. In fact, uh, since we're, we were talking right before the recording today, we were talking about schematron rules. Here's another good rule to put uh, in there. So the, the rule of thumb, the validation rule we're going to add to our schematron checker, will be that load sensor children, 
must always be watch list. Have a container field to watch list. Or else it's an error. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, you got that in the uh, notes for today too, Chris? Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, so what else do we have? We've got enabled, <coughs> timeout, progress is active, is loaded, and load time. So most of these are pretty self evident. Uh, we'll look at each one in, in turn, but uh, enabled, we're familiar with that. Uh, is active, we're familiar with that. Uh, we haven't looked at it yet, but is loaded, well, is means it's a Boolean. Okay, so, all right, so that sounds like an output event right there. So when we load time, oh, it must be loaded. Is loaded is going to send a true event, so uh, if, if it succeeds, so then we would get a load time at the same time. Okay, so let's keep drilling down and let's look specifically at these definitions for these different fields. All right, so watch list. Described it a little bit, here it is spelled out. It's a ray, an array of nodes, meaning an MF node type, that uh, essentially lists all the nodes of interest. And often those nodes appear elsewhere in the scene graph. They're doing what they're doing in context of where they should appear. Uh, and so the load sensor, since it needs to know which nodes it's keeping track of, you can just give it a use copy. Uh, uh, so image texture, use my node, my new texture, container field, watch list would be how we define that. Okay, uh, something you can check on is that the uh, nodes to be watched would have a URL field in there because we're detecting whether they load. Where do they load from? The network or the local file system. In each case, there's a URL value, an address in the URL array. So this is why uh, we can uh, do that. This is why browsers can implement it consistently. Uh, this is why not every node can be in the watch list because they don't have this kind of unpredictable time delay problem that comes from file one. Okay. Now, a nice thing about it, it does say that it's an array, so you can have multiple nodes as part of your load sensor. And you can say, well, I need all of my billboard imagery to be in, uh, and, the, and the video at the end before I start this train of animation, bringing a user through it. You say, I want all of that stuff loaded, then a single load sensor with multiple watchless children would be appropriate uh, to go in there. Uh, flip side, if you want individual control of this asset, that asset, a third asset getting loaded, then just use different load sensor nodes. Different load sensor for each one, and then you can route each one appropriately to get the response that you need. Okay. Timeout is not a, uh, uh, an output event, but rather it's a setting. And that's how long do you want to wait for this thing to load. Okay, so if your timeout is set to be zero, then it will wait forever. It won't time out um, and indefinite, and you'll just will sit there and never get. If, if the resource never loads, then you'll never get a uh, load time or, or an is active true. But uh, if you do set a timeout, say at five seconds or 15 seconds or whatever your pain threshold is, then uh, if it has failed to load by the end of that interval, you'll get uh, is active false. And you won't get a load time event. You'll just get is active false because it's timed out, which your script or your behaviors can also react to. Okay, so if we get a load sensor false, then we could send that through a Boolean uh, uh, 
to say, oh, okay, uh, false event, I got a false event, I will, instead of putting up my welcome to X3D land si sign, I'll put up my text that says, we're so very sorry, our scene did not load. Would you please put your money in a stamp, self-addressed envelope, and mail it off to us? Uh, whatever your response is, but it would be an indicator that you could work with and you're seeing that the local file system didn't find the resource you wanted or the network did not provide what you need. More often than not that means a network failure, they're disconnected. Okay. Um, so there you go. And of course as with any, uh, you see this in web browsers all the time, that the browser itself will time out it might get, uh, it might not wait the 15 seconds or the 50 seconds or whatever you sent if the X3D player is getting a signal from the net network, say if the HTTP server response, uh, resource not available, or if the ex browser itself says, I've timed out, that might occur uh, and preempt your timeout. Usually I would expect your timeout to, to happen, but it is possible that we get this other thing. Okay. What's next? Uh, progress. Oh, this is helpful. Uh, we can get a little number. So if you wanted to make a little slider bar showing how much progress has occurred for the stuff to be downloaded, uh, the progress field is what tells you that. Now, we weren't too heavy-handed when we def defined this. We wanted browsers to be uh, somewhat flexible in how they implement it so they can decide whether they want many bytes downloaded or how much of the percentage of the file or how much of the time or what have you. And of course this is often this, this source of maddening frustration. Uh, certain operating systems which uh, will remain uh, unnamed often tend to give you a progress bar as if something's happening. But the progress bar is usually simply uh, tied to a clock and it just is spinning where there might be no activity under the hood. So uh, it behooves browsers, it, it behooves you if you're showing the display to the side. Is this a absolute thing that I want to trust going across? It's supposed to be zero to one. Or is it unreasonable to think that the browser could really know how much has it pulled down and instead I'll give a little spinning thing to show whether there's progress. I would not expect to see the progress value change in its value if there wasn't actual data coming in. What does it mean for your browser? You probably want to read the uh, fine print, read the uh, readme file, the help file, where for that. Okay, and given that progress lets us uh, fancy up our user interfaces, maybe make a script to respond a little better. Uh, the rest are pretty straightforward. Is active, we've already considered. Is loaded means uh, it's uh, true when when everything's been completed. Okay, otherwise it's false if it didn't if it didn't load. And and that's similarly uh, what you get from is active. <coughs> it's important to distinguish is loaded from is active. Okay. Is loaded tells you whether or not my resource succeeded or not. Is active is telling you, is my load sensor still working? Is it still doing something? Okay, so two different things. Then uh, finally, load time is set, but only with is loaded true condition successfully occurs. <coughs> All right, so some hints here. Um, use it. That's what the first bullet says. Use load sensor if your animation chain is not going to make sense when certain things are involved. And uh, boy, I can see all sorts of nice authoring tips and hints here that we might put into our our schematron validator that we're now working on. So that might be a good warning. Uh, warn if. Load sensor not used. Maybe it should be. Do you have to? No. 
if you know that your content is always going to have the image files right next to it, that you're not going to deploy it otherwise, then you might not care. You might not want to bother with it. It does take a little work to set, not just set up the load sensor, but set up a result so that if you get a negative response from the load sensor, you give the user some indication. So your scene might not be that quite that sophisticated, but it's definitely something to consider. And probably the best way to do that is rather than have it respond to failure, the second bullet here is trying to say default to it's not yet loaded and let that be your display. And then upon loading, that not only triggers the animation, but switches out your default behavior. Please stand by while we load resources message or whatever it is so that we're already done. Okay. Uh, second hint we've already discussed uh, is uh, if you have different resources that you want to keep track of, then use separately, then use separate load sensors. One thing uh, you can't do is if you have six addresses in a URL array, load sensor will not tell you which of the six occurred. Okay, so, uh, uh, but you could, if you really want to get super creative, you could create your own script that fed addresses one, to one at a time to an image texture or uh, to some other node and said, did this work? No, it timed out. Load sensor said it timed out. Uh, it failed to load. Okay, now I'll route another string value to my image texture and see if that loads. So you could you could manually create the mechanisms to do all that. I don't particularly recommend it, but you might want to do that for some case. Okay, so here's what it looks like. We have a scene very cleverly named load sensor dot x3d. And uh, uh, what does it do? Well, here's our load sensor right there. And you can see the, uh, the editor for this node is pretty simple. It just gives us uh, enabled and timeout is what's in there. And what happens next? Well, that load sensor will uh, send a value in this case, we've routed uh, to our time sensor, triggering the route, and we've also routed it to a script to print out the value. Okay, so what happens next? The time sensor starts running, and then we'll drive an orientation interpolator, and the orientation interpolator will rotate a transform node, and in that transform node, we've got two sets of text here. We've got uh, Our first text, which we've uh, iconized here, will say, hey, uh, I'm waiting over here. And then our second text will uh, change that and say, we're all loaded. And what we've done, you can see the one text straight on right now, the other text is perpendicular to that. So you're seeing flat text fading straight, facing straight towards the viewer, so it's not visible. So all this simply does is rotate one text out of the way and the other text into view as the positive indicator that my loading has occurred. Okay, so what's the next event for that? Well, that's it. The output to the console, the browser console, prints out a statement that our uh, inline sensor is loaded and it will print out the true or false. So you can use this as a diagnostic at runtime if you need that kind of thing. What else? Well, there it is. Uh, in the scene we in load an inline and when that is succeeded then our text is changed Basically, the text geometry is unchanged. It's just rotating around and out of the pool. 
so that's it for load sensor. And if you pull up the scene itself, you can fiddle around with this, but it's, uh, I think, pretty straightforward. We have a couple of other load sensor examples in there that handle uh, the kelp forest exhibit. Things to uh, pay attention to are setting that container field as the watch list. You can see it right here. Okay, and that does it for load sensor. We'll pick up next time with our next node, which is proximity sensor. Okay, so I'll see you.